Right, thank you for that. I've got to follow that video. Um, in 2015, Norfolk Museum Service won a tender to prepare material for a new display at Chatham Historic Dockyards called Command of the Oceans. The objects and questions were all lifted in the early 1980s from the wreck of the Invincible. The Invincible, which in 1758 sank off Portsmouth in the Solent, was a 74-gun flagship and the first of its name. A wide variety of objects were identified for conservation treatment. These were divided up between myself, an archaeological conservator, and my co-author, Deborah Phipps, a textile conservator. Among the objects we were asked to conserve were copper alloy cauldrons, tankards, buckets, barrels and cartridges, woolen socks, a silk neckerchief, a syringe and even lumps of coal. One object was thought to be unusable for either display or interpretation. The object in question was a brown felted soldier's hat as seen in this picture. Like many of the objects, the hat had undergone extensive post-excavation conservation treatment in the early 1980s. This res the results of these treatments varied considerably. Some had sympathetically preserved the shipwrecked material, while others had left thick, sticky oil residues, excess adhesive, migrating salts, and misshapen objects. After Deborah had made an initial assessment, she came to me as the treatment the hat had undergone wasn't like anything she'd come across before. For some reason, the inside of the hat had been lined with layers of synthetic paper-like material adhered with copious quantities of an undocumented adhesive, which we believed to have been a PVA wood glue. It had been gap-filled with thick, painted cardboard and felt patches, and this resulted in misshapen and distorted appearance. After discussions with Chatham, we decided to see if we could undo this treatment so that the hat could be used for display or as part of their tours and learning activities. We also decided to work together, share the project, our specialist knowledge, and the pain. Once we were sure what shape the hat would have been, as seen in the slide before, which would have been domed with a flat brim, we knew that reshaping the hat would require removing the lining. We trialled numerous methods, including humidification and a variety of solvents. In the end, only acetone had any effect. Between us, we blithely made an estimate of five working days to remove the lining using acetone and cotton wool swabs, reshape and manufacture a basic mount. Unfortunately, we soon discovered that we had woefully underestimated the number of layers and quantity of adhesive they had used. The lining was applied randomly in pieces of varying size, sandwiched together with the defiant adhesive. Acetone swabs turned out to be ineffectual, and unless we were soaking the lining with the solvent, it evaporated too swiftly. We were concerned that applying larger quantities would allow the adhesive to travel further into the felt, leaving it as stiff and unresponsive. It was also really messy. In contrast, over the last six years or so, I've been, and still am, working on a medieval polychrome altarpiece, which has been given a very unsympathetic Victorian makeover. On this project, I've been making good use of gels to soften over paint and thick yellowed varnishes, allowing me to remove them with swabs and mechanically, and I wondered if solvent gels could be of use in the removal of the lining, particularly as they provide the advantage of controlled and prolonged exposure to solvents. On a test area of the rim of the hat, we applied an acetone solvent gel of Carpobol e EZ2 and Ethamine C25 with a barrier layer of spider tissue and covered it with cling film to slow evaporation. The prolonged exposure to acetone provided by the gel allowed us to start removing the lining layer by layer. Our exposure times varied from 5 to 20 minutes depending on the stubbornness of the adhesive. We found that wetting the spider tissue with IMS first helped ensure good contact and easier application of the gel. Um, we took turns working on the hat, often on alternate days, and it was really interesting to see how each other had struggled and gotten on, because it was horrendous. Um, although the process was quite effective, the density of the um, layered lining was surprising, as even after prolonged exposure, the solvent vapour was unable to penetrate more than one or two of the layers. Even with the solvent gel, the removal of the lining necessitated using swabs, forceps, metal spatulas, and because the lining material was so difficult to tear, even when wet, scalpels and scissors. 
We continued this methodology to remove the cardboard sections that were adhered to the surface of the lining and had the added surprise that the felt gap fills were actually bright blue, which had been painted brown. These were also far more difficult to remove than they'd been integrated into the lining. Deborah had the idea of using a material called Thos shape, not only to create a mount, but construct, to construct a former around which we could reshape the hat. The Thos shape, which is also a felt, in this case a heat-activated polyester, was steam-ironed around an existing mannequin head, which had been covered in foil. Um, Our hope was that once the lining had been removed, we could use a combination of humidity, pins and weights to reshape the hat over this. This might have been a bit optimistic, as we had presumed that the solidity of the felt hat was a property of the lining rather than a condition of the felt. But as the lining and majority of the visible adhesive residue was removed, just how inflexible and misshapen the hat was became apparent. It appeared that during the application of the lining, large enough quantities of adhesive had penetrated the felt. This meant that our plans to reshape the hat would require further intervention and solvent exposure. After a bit more experimentation, we realised that solvent gels just weren't a practical solution to this dilemma, and as risk of further migration of the adhesive had been reduced, we decided to put the hat in an enclosed acetone environment, as seen here. The hat was initially left in the acetone environment, a sealed Stuart box, for intervals of about an hour and a half, but again, it became apparent we needed to be a little braver. A bucket of acetone was discussed several times. <laughs> but we settled on leaving it overnight instead. To our relief, the hat emerged the next morning pliable enough to start the reshaping process. The foss shaped former allowed us to pin the hat in place while flexible weights applied pressure. The process was undertaken several times until the hat was in what we believed to be the correct form. The whole process took two to three days. This resulted in the um, hat outgrowing the Stuart box and being rehoused in a larger, really useful box, where we slowly let it set into its new shape by reducing the amount of acetone we put in with it. So you can see in the box it's becoming more domed. Whilst we were reshaping the hat, some experimentation was undertaken to see if suitable gap fills for the hat could be constructed from Foss shape. Small pieces of the material were shaped, ironed, dyed, and even painted to determine whether sympathetic fills and colour matches could be achieved. Methods of attaching foss shaped gap fills using Japanese paper hinges and a variety of adhesives were also explored. Although Chatham Dockyards had been very keen on us gap filling the hat, once we placed the reshaped hat on its support, it didn't seem necessary to gap fill it as the object was stable and readable without the addition of new material that could be confused with the actual object and was arguably one of the mistakes we were originally trying to rectify. This opinion was also shared by Chatham once they'd seen the pictures of the mount. To mount the hat for accessible long-term storage and potential display, we again turned to Foss shape to create our support. A foss shaped domed form was covered with polyester wadding and cotton jersey, which created a cushioned mount. This was set into a base of plastisote covered with cotton jersey. Bent entomological pins pushed into the foss shaped mount secured loose edges and small detached fragments in place. The small sections of the pin visible on the outside of the hat were covered in polyethylene tubing, which had been colour matched with acrylic paint to make them less obtrusive. The treatment of the hat has resulted in an accessible, stable and hopefully historically accurate object, which rather than languishing in a store is now actively used part of the collection to tell the story of the invincible. Had more time and analytical resources been available during this project, it would have been very interesting to have gotten a more concrete identification of both the adhesive and the lining material. Although the treatment took far longer than originally estimated, without the use of solvent gels, the treatment might have been even more time-consuming and far less controlled. For us, the project highlighted the benefits of working in a multidisciplinary studio, where different specialisms come together to solve conservation challenges. In this instance, the sharing of knowledge and materials has had a long-lasting impact. For textile conservator Deborah Phipps, solvent gels have become a functional and accessible option for future treatments, such as removing adhered labels on vulnerable fabrics. And due to its many diverse applications, Foss shape has been enthusiastically adopted by me, an archaeological conservator, for numerous recent projects, including the manufacture of a support for a suit of 16th century armour. 
Um, I'd like to thank Chatham Historic Dockyards and the conference. Thank you.